Right, anyway, do a thing, a thing uh, edit after that. Okay, shall we try uh, jump right into it? Do it. Okay, okay. So, hello everybody. Welcome to a little podcast session about Kakeit. And it was a little confusing to me what actually Kakeit is. And then I met Gabe, and then also Martin joins, and then I think we can just clarify a couple of things. So I'm the noob here. I'm asking stupid questions, and hopefully I'm getting some smart answers from those two guys. So Gabe, do you want to say maybe one, two sentences about yourself? Sure. Uh, yeah, I am, um, well, uh, I'm, I guess I'm the de facto chief architect for KKIT. Um, I've worked uh, in a lot of different IBM Watson services uh, over my time here and uh, was part of founding the Watson core mission to aggregate the common uh, semantics across all the different Watson products into a set of inner source libraries that have ultimately fed into creating the KKIT open source project. Okay, that's a long story, but I think we have the right person to talk to. And Martin, what about yourself? Yeah, I'm an open source developer in the cloud native computing space. Uh, I'm a maintainer at Helm and I've been contributor to OpenTelemetry, uh, Kubernetes ecosystem, and back previously to that in uh, OpenStack. Um, so yeah, probably most of my, I work over at IBM, uh, uh, like Gabe, and uh, yeah, involved in the, the open source space for the last, I suppose, nearly 10 years. Okay, cool, cool. I mean, we found out that we have been working in the same team and we even didn't know each other, interestingly. <laughs> but now we know each other. Perfect. <laughs> so, now the question, the, the million dollar question is what is actually KKIT? Cool. Yeah, that is a million dollar question. Um, and uh, there's, I guess there's kind of two answers to it. So the, the really practical answer is it's an extremely useful tool that we inside the Watson team have found uh, to help us get our house in order. But the more uh, aspirational answer to that is that um, KKIT is a set of tools that try to bring um, strong developer practices to the world of AI. Um, so at a high level, mostly what we try to do in the world of AI is approximate really, really complicated functions, right? So if you think about any AI model, really it's inference time. Uh, what it does at inference time is you take some inputs, you perform a really complicated function trying to approximate something in the real world, and you get an output back. Um, and generally speaking, uh, most tools out there uh, define that function's interface as a pile of math in and a pile of math out. Um, and maybe that math happens to look like a string and a string, uh, but it doesn't get much more sophisticated than that. But if we think about humans, and when we do functional things, uh, we're thinking in terms of actual semantic constructs, right? I'm I'm understanding the, the, that the shape of what I'm taking as my input is a, a visual field of an office, and what I am uh, getting back is, you know, a, a detection of a, a, a pen container, right? Um, and I know that those things are semantic constructs. And so KKIT aims to separate out what we are trying to do, that functional uh, interface, from how we do it, uh, because the technology landscape is changing literally by the day, sometimes the hour at this point, uh, and pinning ourselves to one specific technology is a recipe for being behind very quickly. But the actual problems that we're trying to solve aren't changing that fast. We're just getting better at solving them or finding new techniques that solve them in different ways. So KKIT tries to separate these, those things and really provide some basic object orientation to the world of solving AI problems. Perfect. And Martin, so we, we hear that it's open source. So what's your take on this? I, I just brilliant, actually, because... Uh... It's funny. So I come in from a different angle and uh, I come in from the non AI person uh, angle, I suppose. And the person that, you know, you know, it's great having the AI. It's great. These models and Gabe and all his colleagues, you know, they know it down to the end degree and know the technology. But I suppose for a lot of us coming in is what, what can we do with it? How, how, how can we consume an AI model and can it give us value? And really, at the end of the day is if I give it information, will it give me back information that's going to be useful to me? And what Gabe said there is, is, is really, really true is for me. And of course, I'm going to simplify this to, the, to we'll call the common person, which is us people that are not the AI experts is, you know, where basically KK will provide a model so that somebody can use it. So in other words, if I'm writing a piece of, uh, if I'm writing an application tomorrow morning and I want to be able to use an AI model to do something for me, KK is going to provide that for me. It's going to give me the API 
I'm going to I'm going to ask it the question. It's going to give me the data back, and then I'm going to use that data. Now, probably, and we'd probably touch on it in a while is the one side effect, and it's probably the glaring thing here is some someone's going to say, and especially if we have children out there that uh, if you have a child out there that has use chat GPT to write an essay or anything else, uh, especially a historical essay, is that sometimes <laughs> what you ask and what you get back isn't always right uh, or correct. And I suppose the key part of that is is the models and how they've been trained, et cetera, like that. That's the real key here is. But what KK provides you is the ability to access, access those models yeah, with nice APIs without having to understand all the intricacies of the models, but that you're using a trusted model to give you the information back. Okay, so you would say KKIT is basically a model serving platform. You, you come in with a trained model and you get back an API automatically. Is that the magic? So KKIT also includes training semantics. Um, and so I think maybe at this point it's important to talk about, you know, what all KKIT is uh, and, you know, anytime I start talking about these things. I start in my head enunciating capital letters and underscores, and obviously you can't hear that when I'm speaking, but um, KKIT itself is a framework. The KKIT community that we are building, thanks to Martin and, and, and others in open source, is meant to be inclusive of that platform plus first best implementations of actual AI models and AI task solutions using that platform. So in the KKIT community, we have GitHub.com slash KKIT slash KKIT, which is our platform repo that contains the abstractions for how we define uh, data shapes, the abstractions for how we decide, uh, define uh, task implementations, and the abstractions for how we define the task functions themselves. And then we also have KKIT-NLP, which is going to contain implementations of a large collection of NLP tasks with actual models behind it. Uh, and we're building out our set of domain libraries for all of the different common uh, AI domains, vision, um, and, and many others that we have tackled internally inside uh, IBM and Watson that we're working on bringing those open source solutions into KKIT. Um, so you can think about it as sort of two sides of the same coin. We've got that the framework that knows how to speak generic models and generic data objects. And then we've got the actual real task solutions in our domain libraries for NLP vision um, time series down the road, document understanding, uh, whole, a whole bunch of different domains that we are going to be tackling here. Um, so when Martin talks about coming in sort of as the layperson trying to say, I would like to just have a model and run it uh, and make it accessible, what we're really talking about is taking one of those real concrete task solutions. Um, let's get real concrete here. Let's say we're trying to solve the text generation task in NLP, uh, and we're trying to use a Hug and Face Transformers model, right? So in Kakeit NLP, we will have a module implementation that knows how to take transformer models, boot them up, give you a nice uh, loaded model behind a server runtime that can be run in a container orchestration uh, engine of your choice, um, scaled out, using semantics that are appropriate to your application, and then you can hit it either with a, a REST API or a gRPC API and access it just like a web service that you are uh, that you would like to use. So that's basically the, the story of, I just have a model and I want to use it. But the other real persona for using KKIT is the, the actual algorithm developer. Um, so right now we see a lot, a really common pattern is that um, AI models are developed sort of in a vacuum and measured against academic benchmarks. Um, oftentimes the actual code used to write those models is done in notebooks or in kind of ad hoc repositories in, in a, the optimization criteria is that it meets the academic benchmarks, not necessarily that it meets, you know, production grade uh, software engineering capabilities. So the, the goal of KKIT's abstractions is to be very lightweight such that once you have a functional model, which includes code and the actual trained objects, um, that that code that encapsulates what your model is can be baked into a relatively small piece of abstraction, a class that has a run function and a load function. Um, and that can turn that thing with, you know, a, a little bit of hardening to make sure you don't have, you know, 
clauses that are going to raise exceptions down the down the line and hard coded paths and the like. Um, but with relatively uh, a small amount of grooming, you can turn that into a model that you can actually put into production. So that's the, the real uh, the intent behind KKIT's abstractions that the authors of AI um, don't have to worry about serving frameworks and don't have to worry about scaling uh, and don't have to work, learn what a REST server is or a gRPC server is and then remember how and then find somebody that knows what TLS is and then there's an M in front of TLS. Do we have to do M? What is this M in front of TLS? Um, so all of those constraints that many of us have had to solve over and over again for the various Watson services, we're trying to solve those in one place and that's in the KKIT runtime so that the authors of AI have a clean set of interfaces to implement against, and then the consumers of AI can pick that up and run it in their application, um, sort of with a nice interface boundary there. Okay, so I have two questions to you. Um, yes, first of all, what is the M in TLS? The <laughs> mutual, is... mutual TLS. Ah, ah, mutual, uh, I see, the, thank you. Thank it's you. when the uh, server authenticates that the client is in fact who they say they are, um, which is uh -huh, so that's bi the kind of bidirectional. Bi the current one, standard yeah. in uh, you know, bidirectional TLS authentication uh, in cloud applications, but it's a pain in the neck, uh, and and it's hard to remember how to do it, let alone how to you know write a server that knows how to boot it itself up and and it's not appropriate in all settings, right? So if you have a server that you're running locally uh, and some application that you know is going to be communicating over localhost. Um, you don't need mutual TLS if you're contained within a given server, right? You, if your application knows for a darn fact that no one's ever going to access this thing, it's not even exposed to any network ports, you don't need mutual TLS. It's uh, deployment complexity and it is runtime latency that you don't need. So, you know, but if you're deploying in a cloud application where you may not know who all is opening your socket to you, uh, it's best to have mutual TLS. Sorry, that's a tangent, but that's the kind of stuff that some of us have had to solve over and over again that we'd like to not make anybody else have to solve again. Uh, yes, until some, some idiot just creates a development only route to your service and exposes it to public. No, that exactly, right. That's yeah. the thing you want to that you want to uh, avoid. <laughs> yep. Okay. And the second question I had, you said you're booting up the model. How is that working? Is the model persisted on, let's say, course and then on demand K native style is uh, put into a container? Is that how it works? Yeah, great, great question. So let me step back one step and actually say that this is this gets at a really fundamental property of how, so I, I said that KKIT defines models in the abstract. Um, and the, the key thing that is currently true, and there are some places where we may flex this, is that a model has two phases. It's got a boot, a load phase, which may be very expensive, right? You're bringing large amounts of data from disk, possibly even from a remote disk across the internet into memory. And that's expensive, that can take minutes. Um, so that cost should never be born at inference time, right? Uh, when you're actually trying to run the model, you certainly don't want the cost of reading from disk, bringing it into memory, and then running the inference. So one of the key tenets of KKIT, and this is true of just about every other framework as well, to be clear, this is not unique to KKIT, is that loading happens once, inference happens many times. Um, and so that loading operation can be accomplished in many, many different ways, right? Ultimately, you're just trying to get some bits from somewhere into memory. Um, and KKIT, you know, because it's an abstraction wrangling library, uh, allows you to do that in abstract ways. But the main one is find it on disk. Uh, and so that disk may be a virtual disk that in Kubernetes could be mounted from some remote service as a PVC. Um, most notably, we, in our usage of it, typically use uh, an S3 compatible API mounted as a disk. So we'll have some object storage bucket um, that contains our data. Uh, we mount that as a disk in our running server. And then we boot it up and we run it. Um, now, again, one of the things about KKIT is it that, and I think this is where a lot of people get sort of confused, it's like, what actually is it? Uh, it can be many things depending on how you want to deploy it for your application, right? So in its simplest context, it is a server that looks at a certain path on disk when it boots and says, I'm going to load all models that I find there, end of story, I'm done, right? So you boot it up, it's running models, it can serve those models, that's it. Um, but it also, uh, if your application is one that needs to actually manage models dynamically based on the application interactions, can be used with um, KServe's model mesh capabilities, which are designed to handle dynamic wrangling of models 
in running server instances. So KKit's runtime can also function as a serving runtime for model mesh, which means uh, and when you tell model mesh register this new model, it can say, okay, here's a new path that you should go look for a model, uh, go ahead and load it dynamically. And so you can get the properties of model mesh and it's dynamic loading and rebalancing of model replicas with KKit as well. Now, to be clear in the world of foundation models, which is where we find ourselves today, that use case with model mesh is rough. Uh, model mesh itself was designed to work with very lightweight models that can easily be brought in and out of memory. Um, foundation models very much are not that. Um, and so they're much larger and their boot time is much larger and their resource requirements are much, much greater, such that some of the heuristics in model mesh don't apply well to foundation models. So in the brave new world of foundation models uh, that we find ourselves, we're targeting KKIT primarily at that sort of simpler, boot it up, load a model, sit there and serve the model case. Um, but, uh, you know, as we find ourselves in a world where we're mixing and mashing some foundation models for really hard tasks, some simple models for simple tasks, um, such as, for example, uh, PII detection with regular expressions for social security numbers and emails, um, those models certainly don't need, you know, a foundation model behind them. They're just as well served by a regular expression. So um, we're going to eventually find ourselves, that's actually what the C in KKIT loosely stands for is composition, uh, is that we're going to, we're going to have an all of the above approach where KKIT can provide common interfaces and common serving plane across models that vary wildly in their technology under the hoods. So, Perfect. Thank or, you. so, so just pulling, pulling it back up a second, Gabe, on that yeah. is, you know, and it's incredible when you listen to, you know, the technology that goes in behind it and the architecture and so forth. But if we come back up again for the application developer, this is a lot of stuff that they don't need to know. Yes. Uh, <laughs> where, and this is where the beauty, I suppose, of when we abstract back up, uh, Romeo, is that KKIT is providing this abstraction up around uh, through APIs. So where the where the um, model is loaded and where it's running doesn't really matter all that much. Yes, it does to matter point of view, someone for infrastructure or whoever's putting that forward, but from the application point of view, it doesn't really matter. And what's the beauty about that is, if, for example, you have version one of a model that might be tuned a certain way, and then it comes along that we'll say the um, uh, the the data scientist comes along and said, right, we're gonna we're gonna fine tune that again, and now we're gonna have a version two of the model. That model can be swapped in and out from where it's uh, running or where it's deployed. And uh, the application uh, won't won't notice the difference because there'll have to be no changes done to the code. So that's I think that's where you get the real power of it, uh, Gabe, isn't it? Yeah, no, I think that's that's a great point, Martin. Right, that sort of illustrates the stability of the interfaces that you're trying to do. You know, again, coming back to the, the you know the top level value statement, KKIT separates that task definition interface from the actual implementation, right? So in Martin's example, you know, you're you're doing basic model versioning, maybe the even the technology under the hood hasn't changed, but you've got a, a fresh new model. So it's the same interface, it's the same service in Kubernetes. So, you know, your client code literally doesn't need to change, you're just rolling over a, a replica set in Kubernetes. Maybe down the road, maybe transformers as we know them today, um, become passe because somebody figured out how to get exactly the same quality with a model that runs on a tiny CPU. Who knows? Maybe this will happen. When that happens, you're free to flex not just the actual replica set of that pod, of that of that deployment. You can actually come up with an entirely new deployment topology, uh, running an entirely different library that actually is going to serve exactly the same set of interfaces, right? And so now you're not just rolling over a replica set, but you're rolling over your entire deployment architecture, and the client code hasn't changed a bit. That's that's again. This is one of the things that's a little bit tricky about KKIT is that it's it's both uh, trying to give you something that's useful right now and also trying to provide you that future compatibility um, for changes in you know, the industry that we can't predict quite yet. So it's, okay. in a way, I suppose it's the similar is, is similar to how Spotify, uh, I suppose, revolutionized the industry with its blue green and the idea of that, right, suddenly we're gonna change our whole website and we put it to X amount of people and see how that goes. And if it takes over, then it comes in that now you're bringing it into uh, AI models and the capability with the framework from KKIT. 
Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, I heard about this blue green from uh, KSurf already. So can we maybe put KSurf, Model Mesh, and KKit into perspective? Yeah, definitely. Uh, let me try to let me try to frame some of those things. So KSurf provides a Kubernetes native technology layer for deploying models. And really it has, as far as I'm aware, two, two and a half different flavors of existence. Um, the two main flavors of KServe are multi-model serving and single model serving. So in the single model serving sort of KServe classic, you have one replica set per model. And uh, you know, the life cycle of that model is strictly pinned to the Kubernetes resources that underpin it, right? And I think when I say 2.5, I believe, and I'm still learning here too, um, that KServe Classic can actually function in two different modes. One, using standard Kubernetes constructs like a deployment to actually manage that, uh, or using Knative to get scaling properties based on traffic patterns to that uh, replica set. So, so within Classic, where you have you know single model serving per replica set, you can manage that replica set using a standard Kubernetes deployment, or you can use, use uh, Knative. Uh, on the other hand is multi-model serving, and that's where Model Mesh comes in. This is actually technology that came out of the same group that I'm part of um, in, in Watson that was donated to KServe as one of our first major open source contributions. Um, and so that one is focused on separating the life cycle of the Kubernetes resources, the actual pods that are running it from the models themselves. And again, this was initially designed around much lighter weight models than we see today. Um, but in, in model mesh, uh, in, in the multi-model serving, um, you have each replica of your serving runtime can host many models at once. And those models can be dynamically loaded and unloaded. So model mesh itself takes care of the replication semantics of the individual models within the mesh. So the mesh has a, a pool of resources occupied by its runtimes, uh, and then it will decide which models to scale up and down when based on their usage patterns. Um, and so that layer of technology is all about basically model routing and model provisioning and, and loading and scaling. And KServe itself makes no explicit bones about what the model is or what even the model runtime is. Now, just the way that KKit has its platform, and then we've got our selection of domain libraries, KServe has its platform and its selection of pre-existing out-of-the-box model runtimes. So they have standard model runtimes for things like TensorFlow Serving, Torch Serving, Selden IO, um, and, uh, and, and many others. Um, so in exactly that same way, KKIT runtime is a serving runtime. It's an example of what you can put behind both of those flavors of KServe to actually meet the serving interface um, and, and boot it up and run it. So in many ways, they're complementary pieces of technology. So KKIT is just, uh, and, and the main difference between KKIT's runtime and the other ones that are already available, again, is that sort of interface layer. Uh, whereas most of those runtimes are vectors in, vectors out. Uh, and that basic, I mean, that, that, that accomplishes the standard requirements of what you need to serve ML models, but it puts a large onus on the client side of that interaction to understand what that model actually is. So if I am in a space where my actual semantic inputs are tweets or some other structure, data structure that's relevant to my enterprise, um, it's my job to translate that into vectors, right? So I have to know how to go from there to math so that I can send that over to my model. Um, maybe maybe it's a little bit higher level, maybe it's sequences of tokens or something like that. But it, there's still a deep understanding of what that model is doing before you can actually make the invocation call. Um, and then correspondingly on the way back, I get math back, right? I get vectors back and I need to be able to map that back to whatever is meaningful in my application. So KKIT tries to move that one level higher and say, you know, all you have to do is frame your inputs as this standard input structure, it, whether it's a document, uh, an image, a video, a time series, and then you get back semantically meaningful objects too that say, you know, here are the entities I found and their labels and their confidence scores. Um, so we take care of that pre and post processing and massaging in and out of the actual math of the model on the model side. So we encapsulate that with the model. Perfect. Okay. Before I follow up on that, I have a question. Two questions to Martin. One of it is a quiz question. So the first one is, do you know what KKIT stands for? I guess Gabe knows it. I don't well, know. I don't know what KKIT is for. It doesn't stand for anything, Romeo. Uh, it yeah. loosely okay. stands for something. So the, the, the name behind KKIT um, 
is trying to get at what KKIT is doing. It is providing a framework for composing different abstractions uh, in AI space. So loosely, the CAI is for compositional AI, uh, and the kit is because it is a kit. Um, and okay. the other reason for the name is that IBM is really focusing on open source presence in several key technology verticals. And the first one that's you know really leading in open source is Qiskit or Quiskit, depending on how you choose to pronounce it. Uh, that's our open source technology in the quantum domain. Uh, and we wanted to make it clear that from a naming perspective, KKIT is thematically aligned as IBM's uh, you know, strategic entry into open source um, in the AI space. Okay, perfect. And the second question I had to Martin is, uh, I mean, Gabe, you said you have models in what's in the Watson NLP project, basically, no? Um, I guess those are uh, uh, licensed in Apache 2. So the question is, is Apache 2 appropriate license for models? And second, uh, does it cover something like liability? So if your model kills someone indirectly, can the one who created the model and open sourced it under Apache 2 be sued? Noted by chance? Are we, so are you, you're asking, are we uh, open sourcing models with Apache 2 license? Is yep. that the question? Yeah. 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 Uh, First and foremost, when you look at KKIT, that's KKIT the framework. So it's independent of models. And always when we work in open source, because IBM wants to make sure that open source is open source. And what I mean by that is there are no gotchas with licenses. And that's why we always look at the permissive licenses, especially Apache 2, it'd be our, our number one license, also MIT and BSD. Um, but the key here is when we were putting the community out there, we wanted to make sure that it was an Apache 2 license where people can come in, use the community, build in the community, contribute to the community without any gotchas to them. With regard to models, I think that's a separate entity altogether. Um, so there are open source models out there. Hugging, Fo uh, Hugging Face is a really good community that has a massive catalog of open source models. Uh, also through open API or uh, open AI, et cetera. There's different models out there as well, uh, varying degrees. From an IBM perspective, I think that will be uh, a different ball game altogether. And I think that will be down to the models that are provided on probably the Watson X platform that was uh, released this year, or I will say, was it May timeframe, um, Gabe? Uh, the, the, the initial previews have been released. Uh, the official launch of the product is uh, early July. Coming, early coming July. Early July. There was a pre-release in, in May, I think around the uh, the Tink conference. And that's where the where uh, models are going to be provided for business and so forth. So it'll be under, I suppose, business licenses, et cetera. So it'll be a different ball game altogether. So just want to make that clear on the framework and the models are are, are separate. Yep. Yeah, that's okay. that's a super important point. And and definitely Romeo coming in with the zinger on like how to license models and what the responsibility of the model owner is. Um, you know, I think um for the time being, concrete models are not part of the KKIT ecosystem. Um and so KKIT will be able to serve models that come from open source domains that have been open sourced independently under their own licenses. Um, but KKIT itself is not responsible for the licensing of those models. Um, I do think IBM has a story to tell in that context with models that, as Martin pointed out, will be behind Watson X. Um, and I know that there is discussion around some of those models being released into Hugging Face as open source with their own open source licenses attached. Um, but that is a question for the authors of the models. <laughs> and, and also, it, even though um, Kaken would provide you an ability to use open source models, for example, the NLP domains and the um, computer vision, et cetera, that, that Gabe mentioned, we, like everything in open source, we're not responsible for the model itself and the values you put in and the values you get out. Um, so it's providing you, I suppose, the framework to be able to run models, to be able to uh, uh, give you the API to do it, but what you do with it afterwards or the models you use afterwards then is probably your responsibility. Yep. Well, and actually, honestly, the, 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 this discussion just prompted a, a sticky, uh, which is um, one thing that KKIT could potentially do down the road um, would be actually boot itself up in some kind of a protective mode such that um, it wouldn't allow you to load models that had 
uh, not permissive licenses or, or something to that effect. Um, so depending on how we actually choose to connect to different model repositories, that's a place where we could actually put in checks to say, you know, if you want to run in, uh, you know, GPL incompatible mode or, 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 you know, whatever the, whatever the flavors of gotcha licenses that we have to be careful of in a, you know, enterprise setting, um, we could actually, off, you know, filter those at load time and say, you're not allowed to load this because it doesn't have a permissive license. So it's an interesting idea. Okay. Okay. I mean, so Romeo, thinking actually, about loading. Follow, yeah. To, to just follow on from that, because I think, I think you bring up a really, really good point because this is something I suppose games longer in, 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 in the AI world. And it's something for, you know, new people like us coming into it, uh, looking at it is, is around that, you know, people nowadays, you know, they've come onto it. And I suppose AI has been the big buzzword since ChatGPT and people are going out and using it. ChatGPT is great fun and there's great stuff you can do with it and so forth. But I suppose around that is, is around the model that I don't know, sometimes, you know, the, the simile I get of, 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 of a model is it's like finding uh, a USB key out in the yard and you pick it up and you go, will I stick that into my laptop? And you, I suppose you have no, I, you've no real idea when you use models out in the open like this, where they've come from, uh, what data has been used, et cetera. And I, I'm, I'm not saying that we'd say any of the models that are out there, there's anything wrong in them, but it depends on the data that comes from it. And I suppose from IBM's perspective, that's what, when they started looking at the models and um, doing the work on the models over the last number of years is, that some of the base data that was models were being built on, when they looked at it, they said, right, we need to come up with our own data. So uh, the models that IBM are going to provide in, in their own, in, in, in what's an X, are going to be built off their own data that they built and that they can prove going up along. So the governance and the, you know, trustworthy of the data is going to be the most important part of the models. Um, you know, what we're doing out in KK, yes, to run your models and the whole lot, that's important. And, you know, it's great that we've pushed it out in open source and people can use it, but really the power is going to be around the models. Okay. Yeah, the onboarding of the model is something which interests me. So how do you onboard a model to KK? Good question. Okay, so uh, I, have a, I have a right now story and I have a 2B story. Um, so let me tell you the 2B story. Uh, and then I'll tell you the right now story. So down the road, uh, it, 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 there are a selection of different model flavors and formats that we expect to be the, the standards, right? The 95% coverage case, 90% coverage case of most models that folks are going to want to onboard. Right now, uh, Hugging Face Transformers are probably at least 80% of those models, certainly in the text space. Um, and when you encompass diffusers and other Hugging Face technologies, you get pretty darn good coverage of common domains. Um, so uh, we will have essentially out of the box loaders that you can point at a natively formatted um, uh, hug and face model, transformers, diffusion, what have you. Uh, they can introspect its metadata, figure out what that model, what task that model is trying to solve and bind it to the appropriate KKIT module that's able to actually serve that with the right task interface. Um, so it will be a, a native story that will be zero code to actually, um, you know, get off the ground with a model that fits the assumptions for, you know, flavors of models we've seen before uh, in abundance, right? So that's the that's the future story. The right now story is that KKIT, uh, KKIT only implements its own loader uh, and it knows how to read its own config format. Um, now, the nice thing about this is that it provides a way of, you know, wrangling config across many different frameworks, right? So again, that example of you want to run a, you know, a transformer text generation model, but you also want to perform PII filtering using a regex engine. Um, you know, those are two different underlying frameworks. We can wrap them up with the same model format uh, in KKIT format, and then they can be managed uh, alongside one another. So uh, right now that format is a basic, you know, config YAML file that contains a unique ID of the KKIT module that is going to be used to serve it um, and, and it's off to the races. So uh, an author has to write that Python module that is able to, to boot this thing up and serve it uh, and bind it to the task interface. And then from there, um, once you've got that written down in a Python library, as long as that Python library is available and imported uh, at 
boot time, your Kkit runtime can serve that model. So, okay. and yeah. Yeah. And how about the interface? Is it automatically introspecting the interface yeah, and generating a, the appropriate GPRC and REST that, interface? That, right? That's a great question. Yeah. So that actually is yeah. one of the, the key things that, um, that Kkit does. Um, so as I've mentioned before, you know, there's kind of, there's kind of two different extremes of how interfaces for, um, for AI applications, AI serving frameworks uh, work. There's uh, lowest common denominator, which is vectors in, vectors out. And then there's highest common denominator of blob O stuff that I hope looks like JSON in and blob O stuff that I hope looks like JSON out. Uh, and Kkit tries to split the difference and actually do something more pedantic, um, but with the flexibility of arbitrary data structures. So Kkit's two primary abstractions are a data object and a module. A data object is a way of defining structured data that has well-typed keys and values um, that you know, uh, ultimately is backed by a protocol buffer descriptor, uh, but in code looks like a Python data class. Um, so if folks are familiar with Python and, and familiar with writing data classes, uh, you just do type annotations and uh, you're, you're off to the races. Um, so our data object uh, is essentially a super data class that uh, introspects a protobuf object descriptor from uh, your, your your type definitions in your Python data class. Um, and that protobuf definition is then used as the input and output currency for the actual functions themselves. So there are some slight constraints on how you write your run function uh, and your train function for that matter, because we can, we can also introspect train APIs this way. Um, but for a given module that wants to be runnable, if you, you, well, on the inference side, uh, we bin modules by their task, right? So we define a task in the abstract, let's say text generation or summarization or uh, entity dimension extraction, um, or maybe in the visual space, we might do something like object detection. Uh, each of these has a corresponding signature of the, the required input type. So let's, let's go with object detection and vision, right? You need an image on the input and your output type is gonna look like a collection of bounding boxes with associated labels and confidences, right? So you can imagine writing down those data structures as Python data, data classes. Um, wrapping that in a data object. Now you have protobuf objects to represent that thing and the logical uh, function call to invoke that task is something that takes that, that input data structure and returns that output data structure. And maybe you have some additional optional parameters along for the ride. If your, you know, your specific implementation happens to have, you know, some widgets and some bobbits that you can turn on and off, uh, so be it. Um, so Kkit at, on, in the runtime layer is capable of taking that task definition, looking at all the implementations that it has of that task. So let's say you've got one object detector that uses, you know, some traditional, uh, you know, hand jammed canny edge detector, because that was the thing back when I was studying computer vision before deep learning was a thing. Uh, and then uh, you also have one that uses a modern vision transformer or something like that. Um, you can put both of those behind there and they can have their run signatures. And as long as they meet that task signature, they will both bubble up underneath that tasks RPC. So that RPC becomes the unique access signature for calling models of that task. Um, and all those optional parameters will be bundled up as additional optional arguments that you can pass to that, that RPC. So then at that point, you have a, a serving endpoint. Uh, and in the gRPC server, it's a basic, it uses a gRPC binding. And in the REST server that we're actively building right now, it'll be a REST endpoint for that task. Um, but they'll both have corresponding semantics where, you know, the thing is in memory, you send the request, it looks it up by model ID, finds the right model, runs it through its run function, uh, takes its response and returns it back to you. So again, the idea there is that the author of the AI needs to meet a fairly slim interface for defining their Python function. And we turn that into a, you know, a pedantically defined gRPC or REST server respectively. Um, and, uh, and you're off to the races. Um, one other thing to mention there too, that is a relatively new capability that we're working on in this brave new world of foundation models um, is streaming. So gRPC uh, supports native streaming. It can be both input streaming, output streaming, uh, and any combination of that. So uh, unary object in, stream out, stream in, unary object out, stream in, stream out, unary, unary, right? So it's the it's the four by four matrix. So, so in Kkit, we are, currently supporting unary stream, but we will be, we're working on supporting all the rest. Um, and so this will allow you for models and tasks where it's appropriate uh, to have streaming semantics. And the same, we'll, ha we'll have corresponding um, 
stream support in the REST server using server-side events. So the idea here is that uh, you know some tasks logically support streaming. Text generation is a perfect example, right? So uh, you give it a prompt and you stream a sequence of tokens out. And especially because these models are relatively slow and many of the applications that you wanna build will have sort of an interactive flavor um, a, la a chat bot or potentially a code assistant or something else where you want to be, you know, percolating responses as they come, streaming that set of tokens out on the way back uh, is, is a better user experience. Um, another example would be something like time series uh, anomaly detection, right? So you this would be a case for input streaming where you'd have uh, an input stream of, of observations that may be indefinite too. You could even imagine this in an indefinite streaming case. And as you're streaming in your inputs, you're getting a stream of anomaly uh, values back, right? So that might be an example where you would have a stream to stream uh, case. So depending on your task, but then you could certainly imagine something like text classification doesn't logically support streaming at all because there's no stream on the output. It's just give me the whole thing, figure out what it is, right? Um, so that doesn't support streaming. So we'll, we'll have different Different tasks will logically support or not support different flavors of streaming, if that makes sense. Sorry, that was a total rabbit hole. Right, streaming. Right. <laughs> but clearly, that's Martin? what I'm thinking about right now. <laughs> okay. Martin, any comments on that? Uh, yeah, I, I suppose, you know, I think it's fantastic, you know, showing what's going on in behind the hood and, and all that, that Gabe has described there in the whole lot. And I suppose if I just abstract up again, from, from two angles and I look at the app developer and the app developer is wondering what's happening here, they're still just using the API. And this is the beauty of KKIT here that it's going on under the hood. And if you don't understand the, uh, with the engine or how the engine's working or the pistons that are in it and the whole lot, it doesn't matter because you're still just going to call your API. And then I suppose on the other side, what Gabe described around the data objects and the modules and stuff is that if you're the person that's creating your module and you want to make that module available for KKIT to run, it's just two things, which is lovely. And they're two, well, there's a little bit more to it, but really it's essentially your two Python um, objects, one being your data object, which is your the, uh, the data that's going in and the data that's going out. You just define what the, what the format of that is. And then your module then is, what I call is, is like the hooks or what we've had called, what we call callbacks in the past stitches, the three, maybe the three or four functions like load, uh, run, uh, train, or something like that, that you want to be able your module to do. So that once you put them into a particular directory and tell KKIT, there, where, there it is, then KKIT can just start it up and make it available for people to call through the API. So KKIT is doing, as, as, as um, uh, Gabe has eloquently described, it's doing a hell of a lot of stuff under the hood to simplify it for people, you know, that the application developers, but also uh, the people creating module, uh, models as well, be it uh, your data scientists or your AI model engineers, et cetera. Perfect. Okay. Then another question, um, does take it also support training of models or it's inference only? Great question. Yeah. So um, it does support training. So, uh, it supports training in a couple of interesting ways. So um, training, unlike inference, is a lot harder to abstract, right? So you can think about inference tasks being something that is going to be common across wildly divergent implementations of that task, where the, the function signature is, stays consistent, but the actual um, implementation of what's happening under that function signature changes a lot. Um, training, the function signature for performing a training is going to be very rigorously pinned to the implementation of what's happening in that training, right? So again, using our examples, let's take let's take an example of entity mention detection, right? So this is a common task in, in NLP, where your job is to take a sequence, a, a string, right, and find classes of entities uh, and where they are located in the, in the, in the sequence, right? So, um, you know, on the inference side, you've got a very well-defined structure, text in, sequence of spans with labels and confidences out, right? Um, on the training side, let's imagine two wildly different implementations of, um, of entity mention detection. One, using a transformer where you're doing some kind of transformer magic to produce spans and tokens and identifications, and one that uses regexes, right? So if your entities are email addresses and social security numbers and the kind of things you're concerned about for PII, it really doesn't make sense to use a 
big hunk and transformer to do this stuff. We have well-defined regular expressions for these things. Uh, and the logical train operation is take a bunch of regular expressions and write them into a configuration file. So the function signature for doing that is completely different than the function signature for train me transformer based entity mention detection. So that is all to say that training is slightly different in KKit than inference. So on inference side, we bundle up by task in the abstract. On training side, it really is on the individual module implementations to say how you train them. So again, using our two entity mention detection examples, each one would have a train function defined on its module class. They have wildly different function signatures. Again, regular expressions versus you know sequence of training data objects, et cetera. Um, but KKit, in the same way that it introspects the inference RPCs, will inference will introspect those training RPCs as well. So it'll look at training. It'll come up with a RPC per module rather than an RPC per task because there is no real commonality between modules. Um, but it will also host endpoints that say, "Go perform that train function for me." Um, now, training again has different properties when you actually invoke it relative to inference. So inference, you can generally think of as a synchronous operation, right? You're saying uh, in a reasonable amount of runtime, perform this, you know, this inference for me. Um, so it's, it's, you know, inference is very net naturally a synchronous operation. Training, uh, except in the most trivial case where your training is write a bunch of regexes into a config file, um, it's going to be an asynchronous operation sort of by its very nature. Now, ultimately, it's going to happen synchronously somewhere, right? There's going to be some process in memory that's going to say, I'm running all of these training bits. Uh, and if I happen to get killed, our training is done here because there's not much we can do. Now, there's all sorts of frameworks. You can add resilience to that, yada, yada, yada. From KKIT's perspective, the modules train function is the point where it's synchronous, right? So once we get into invoking that train function, it is a synchronous operation. But from KKIT's API perspective, um, we, we can frame this in both ways. So training is, we're still working on some of our training semantics, uh, but generally speaking, it's framed as an asynchronous API where you call it, you get back a handle to your training job. The training job is gonna run in process, crank away, do, it, do its job. Uh, you can check the status of it. And the output of that training job will be a saved KKIT model somewhere where you tell it to save it. Um, so this requires a little bit more deployment orchestration to make sure that you have a common location to save these things in um, and the like. Uh, and now at a higher level, um, if you want to orchestrate this in a cloud environment, we're going to use some kind of an orchestration engine above the top of this to provide resilience to pods dying. Um, so uh, as I described it, it's sort of the, the local version of, of running training with KKIT, right? So if I boot up a single pod, I call train, uh, it's going to run there in the Python process, and then it's going to be done. Uh, but obviously, yeah, in, in, in yeah. the cloud, there are many different technologies that do this in a much more robust way. So uh, examples that come to mind are a Ray job scheduler, um, a native Kubernetes job, uh, a Kubeflow pipeline, um, X, Y, Z, there, there are many of them. Yeah. So. Okay. Not shockingly, KKIT will have an abstraction for this because uh, KKIT really is just an abstraction wrangling library. So we will have different train executors that allow you to delegate the do the work synchronously part to a engine of your choice. Um, right now we are leaning, uh, leaning into uh, Ray jobs, but this is still an exploratory effort. So that's not 100% committed. Um, we're, we're investigating how far we can go with that because that uh, aligns well with other IBM strategic open source directions. Um, but we're also investigating native kube jobs uh, and certainly uh, Kubeflow pipelines is in the discussion as well. So um, basically the idea will be that the runtime server that's exposing the API when configured appropriately will not just say, go run this right here in my Python process, but will instead spawn the appropriate resilient uh, task. And then if that server that happens to be serving your specific request dies, you know, you make a request to look up by your handle again, uh, you get to a different replica, it's perfectly capable of looking up that information. Standard cloud resilience stuff um, is, is where we're going with this. And, and what if I want to do DDP or TF distributed? Can I do that? Or do I have to implement it myself in the class, in the train? Function? Good question. Yeah. So this gets at sort of different flavors of distribution. Um, so I'm sure there are industry standard terms for this, and I am really bad at reading things. Um, but in my head, I frame this kind of question. There's actually like really two different versions of distribution. There is what I would call external distribution, where you are 
having a framework that is capable of running many different instances of your task, in this case, training. Um, and it is responsible for making sure that those jobs get run somewhere in a resilient way. And then you would have internal distribution that is actually inside the implementation of the specific training module that says, I know that there's an embarrassingly parallel problem here. I want to distribute the work of that problem over a pool of resources. Um, and, you know, the simplest thing is doing that with a, you know, GPU right here that I have access to, but you can obviously get to a much larger, more complicated definition of that internal distribution by farming it out over multiple nodes uh, with some kind of a framework like, uh, you know, TorchX or TF Distributed or, or any of these others. Um, so I think you, you actually nailed it where you said that that's your problem, not my problem, <laughs> which I mean is, is is obviously a flippant answer here, right? So KKID is responsible for that extra external distribution class. That's what its train executor abstraction is going to do. And we will, again, sort of KKID the framework is responsible for that. KKID the collection of domain libraries will absolutely be responsible for the flavor of internal distribution where appropriate, right? So if we have predefined training functions for common algorithms, um, let's say fine tuning a text classification algorithm off of BERT-based uh, transformer models, right? So um, we very much could and will implement the appropriate internal distribution mechanism inside the definition of that def train function. Um, so our out-of-the-box domain libraries will have flavors of internal distribution available to them. Um, but okay. uh, that is a case-by-case -case basis, right? So what it means to do that internal distribution is going to vary wildly depending on what exact uh, network architecture you're using and exactly what, uh, you know, task you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. I suppose just to add to that really is around, you know, you'd expect in a majority of the cases, well, not a majority, but you'd expect in a certain, uh, a certain level of cases that the models will have been trained sometimes somewhere else, uh, as, um, Gabe said, maybe using other technologies like uh, PyTorch and Ray, et cetera. Um, and just as an aside on that, you know, Folly and uh, IBM strategy always for open source. We leverage a lot of these open source communities, but we give back in. So we have contributors and we've maintainers in uh, the different communities like Ray, PyTorch, KServe, uh, Kubeflow, et cetera, because we always believe if we're going to use it, we need to give back into the community as well. So a lot of these training, uh, can happen, which may be independent of KKIT, or as um, Gabe said, maybe it's for fine-tuning and stuff like that, depending on the models. But as as we're saying, Gabe, probably, especially around large language models and foundation models and stuff, their training will be done probably yes. not through KKIT. And uh, yeah. when it comes to KKIT, maybe it's fine-tuning that will happen, maybe. That's that's a great point, Martin. Let me, let me like dig on that one for just a second. So the world of foundation models kind of blows up the standard two sides of the coin dichotomy that we're used to in um, in AI, right? Prior to the world of foundation models, we generally thought about, you know, a training operation and an inference operation for a given model, right? Um, now that training operation, especially, you know, it, it's been a slow creep towards the world of foundation models. Um, you know, your training used to be just plain vanilla, like hand me a bunch of samples, I will from ground zero train you a model. And then it became, okay, well, give me that plus a pile of word to vec word embeddings. And then it became that plus, you know, like maybe a few other pre-trained assets, or maybe you had the option to do transfer learning from some other model. So the world of foundation models just like writes that in stone, like thou shalt do transfer learning, because generally speaking, thou don't have a giant GPU cluster to train an actual foundation model from scratch. Um, so IBM's strategy with Watson Core, uh, sorry, sorry, Watson X and KKIT really splits that into two very different flavors of training task. Um, and the from scratch, huge amount of resource uh, requirement is something that is expected to be done infrequently. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly there are organizations that will want to be able to do this. And that's part of the Watson X story is to provide access to our, uh, GPU clusters for this from scratch style training. Um, all of that stack is managed by a different set of open source technologies that IBM is, is open sourcing under the project Codeflare bundle. Um, the, the reason that these are fairly separate is because fundamentally they're solving very different problems, even though on the, like, 
surface of it, they're saying, give me some raw materials and give me a model. Um, KKIT's responsibility really lies in that right-hand side, if you will, the fine-tuning or prompt tuning or otherwise tailoring a pre-trained base model to my specific problem at hand, and then the actual serving of either the base model with no adjustments or the tuned in some flavor of tuning model uh, for the user. So that's that's really where KKIT's sweet spot is. It's meant to be more of that programmatic tuning that happens in reasonable amount of time with a reasonable amount of resources. And when I say reasonable, I mean, you know, a couple hours, half an hour, sometimes it may be less, you know, if we can get our, our tuning uh, mechanisms down to a much smaller, almost real-time tuning, that will be great. But the idea is that these are tasks that can live a reasonable life cycle mm. in the Kubernetes cluster. Whereas if you're performing a project Codeflare uh, training from scratch, we're talking days, weeks, months of hundreds of GPUs being gobbled up, right? And that's got very different scaling and resilience concerns than I've got a training that needs to run for mm. two hours. Yeah, I mean, that's the promise of foundation model. So you need less data, less parameters. Exactly, and exactly. Go faster, no? okay. exactly right. Yeah. Yep. Maybe one last question. Um, I do usually pre-processing and sometimes post-processing before I actually call the model for training mm -hmm. or inference. So mm -hmm. how is that incorporated in KKIT? Yeah, good, very good question. So let me tackle it separately for training versus inference because I think they're somewhat separate problems. Um, so when let's start on the training side. So training typically involves some kind of data cleansing. Well, first there's like the just organize, like aggregate the data that you need, get them all, get it all together, then do some kind of cleansing and regularization, uh, and then do some sort of preparation into a structured training samples, and then actually run your training operation. Um, some of that is extremely relevant at inference time, and some of it is not so much, right? And so if you have standard things like, let's say you make all your strings lowercase and you remove punctuation, I don't know, some some models like to do this. Maybe maybe you mask out certain words um, or you limit your, your vocabulary to a certain set of things. It's really important that exactly that same mechanism be present at inference time, because if you don't do exactly the same thing, you're gonna get garbage out of your model, right? Because your model is actually learning the patterns that are predicated on all that pre-processing. Um, and so that's actually one of the beauties of how KKIT has a single class that defines its training and its run function. You can put your pre and post processing in a little utility function uh, implementation detail of your class and call it in both places. Now you've literally got the exact same you know, data pre-processing that is happening to your inference samples and your training samples. And that's really powerful to avoid this case where like, it worked great on my academic data set in my notebook and now it's garbage when I put it in production. And why? Oh, it's because somebody was splitting tokens on white space over here and they're using a t different tokenizer over here or here they were lower casing and here they weren't or, um, you know, even more nefarious things. Here I was only evaluating on samples of exactly 250 tokens and here I'm, you know, all of the things that can go wrong between development and you know of a model and inference we can we have one place to do that and it, it sort of forces those things to be co-located um the other thing that's really valuable about that is that you encode that pre-processing in the model itself so when you do the training you know some of these you know things i just said you know whether you're going to lowercase or not whether you're going to split on you know or, or limit by some number of tokens or, or all of these things that might um you know eventually cause problems on the inference side um those things typically are communicated human to human between the people that authored the model and the people that are actually going to run it. So then the people that are going to run it have to take, you know, maybe it's a Python file and they have to copy some code over. Uh, but there's a human communication there that, that is very error prone, let me tell you. Um, so in KKIT land, rather than doing that, you write those values into your config YAML and they get shipped around with the model itself. So when you boot that model to, load, to run it, you are guaranteed to have exactly the same values that were used to train it um, for all of those pre and post processing routines. Um, so you you really encapsulate all that is necessary for that model to do inference. Perfect, thank you. Maybe a last question to Martin. How can developers get started with KKIT? Is there some tutorials or is the GitHub repository the best way to go? Yeah, um, I'd always say come to the GitHub repository for two reasons. Number one, if we don't have the content there, it's all bad, and it gives you a chance to get, as I always say, if you want to come and start contributing to open source, where's the easiest part? Start using it first because there's always holes. Because we do stuff away and we take it for granted. And if you come along, you find stuff, 
tell us, push that PR in, make the changes. We're there to help you uh, get those changes in. Um, also on the readme, it should give you, um, it should have links to, to, to a tutorial and also to um, a demo as well. We have around Hugged Face uh, models that are loaded up by um, KKIT and shows the power of it then where we can have different models on it and so forth. So these are all stuff that's out there in the community. Uh, please come out, uh, please help. Uh, please help us drive it forward because, you know, I think Gabe has shown today, you know, and demonstrated today the value of KKIT, all the stuff it's done under the hood. So for some of us, we go out, we start the car, we drive the car, we think it's great. For other people, they want to know what's going on. They want to know the mechanics. They want to know what engine's in it. They want to know everything else. And I always think with KKIT, it's doing a hell of a lot of stuff under the hood. Whereas for a lot of people, they just want to go in and drive the car. So it's great that that abstraction is there. So yeah, please come out to the community and yeah, yep. just come. Hub.com slash KKIT. That's it. Perfect. Thank you so much. So people are piling up in my lobby because I have another call. Let's finish here. Thank you so much for your time. I hope it was making the stuff a little more clear and maybe we do another session if some stuff, some things are piling up and we need to clarify things again. Awesome. Thanks, Romeo. Perfect. Thanks Thank very much. So much. Take care. Take care. Thanks, Romeo. Bye. Thanks, Kevin.